Can people hear me all right? All right. Not too soft? Good. For a change, I don't have to use this. But you can use it. Is it all right? You're all set, except for the intro, which is in five minutes. <laughs> attending regularly we have made it to the end of the season and I'm sad and I wanted to say thank you for attending the discover Alaska lecture series it's been a great pleasure to host this event and see familiar faces each week if this is your first time to discover Alaska lecture series this event is sponsored by summer sessions and lifelong learning and the UAF geophysical Institute and I would like to extend an invitation to everyone to join us again next summer for all our free events Tomorrow night is our last Music in the Gardens. We are happy to host E.T. Barnett's String Band. They were named for the criminal founder of Fairbanks, and the band will play traditional bluegrass standards locally, 
um, and they've been in the local area for the last two years. We saved the best for last, so please join us. It'll be at the Georgeson Botanical Garden, 7 p.m., rain or shine. Tonight, we're very honored to have Mr. Frank Keim, writer, anthropologist, here to talk about his adventures with his family in Alaska's Arctic wilderness. Originally from near Toronto, Canada, uh, he hitchhiked to Alaska in 1961. He has a BA and MA from UAF and has done further graduate work in anthropology at University of New Mexico. He has been in the Peace Corps, worked as an anthropologist, and taught school in the lower Yukon Delta. Since retirement, he has been busy as an environmental activist, working with the Audubon Society Northern Alaskan Environmental Center and the Interior Alaska Land and Trust. Land Trust. Mr. Kine is the author of White Water Blue, Paddling and Trekking Alaska's Rivers, as well as a book of poems called Voices in the Wind, which are for sale outside later. And we can get you a signature if you like. After his talk, we'll take a short break, uh, about five minutes, and then we'll have open the floor to questions to the author. So if you will, please join me now in welcoming Mr. Five, Frank Kine. I've got to make sure that everybody hears me out there. All right, everybody hear me? Okay, thumbs up. All right, good. Great. Better have that little ticker here. Um, all right. Thanks for coming. Is it okay if I take pictures? Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know why you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been where you have been. All right. Okay, good. Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, that uh, I'm really. It's really a pleasure to be able to do a presentation here on our system work and we're building an auditorium right? because the uh, presentation includes Margaret, uh, Marty, right, and, um, and a lot, right? and a number of times. So, um, and also I'd like to say that, you know, the presentation is not about my adventures per se, right? um, but rather it's a celebration of the Wilderness Act, which, which turned fifth. 50 and September 3rd of this year, 50 years old, Wilderness Act. And this is what it's all about. And uh, I'm celebrating it with my favorite photos uh, from some of my favorite adventures uh, in Alaska Wilderness. And I'll show you uh, in the next, let's see if I can get this going, uh, image here. Uh, my favorite wildernesses are the Arctic. National Wildlife Refuge Wilderness, Gates of the Arctic, and now. And this is primarily where all the images come from, all the books. Now, I'm also going to introduce some of our wilderness champions in the history of the Wilderness Act. I think it's fair to do that. All right? um, and so, also, I'm going to show you some of the wilderness in southeast Alaska. These images, these images don't include Southeast, but um, I have been some of them, and they're beautiful, absolutely beautiful. All right, let's start with um, somebody I consider to be the grandfather of the wilderness movement in the wilderness act, and you recognize him, John Muir, of course, his name is right there. He, uh, he started the ball rolling back in the 1800s. Really, from about uh, 1869, 1870, right, he was of course, um, a man who, he was a man who really felt at home in the wilderness, in the mountains, especially in California, in the Yosemite Park, now the Yosemite Park, more than in the city. And you you uh, take a look at his pictures, you know, when he's, uh, even with his own family, he feels like he's got to get out of here as fast as he can, get back to his home in the mountains. But anyway, he, uh, he founded the Sierra Club, and um, he knew Teddy Roosevelt. He camped out one night in 1903, convinced Teddy to have Yosemite set aside under the federal park system, and that happened in, 19, in 1906. Um, he fought the, uh, a gallant battle in, um, between 1906 and 1913 
keep uh, the dam, the Hetchetchee Dam, from being constructed in that area, and um, lost that, unfortunately. Um, and he died a year later. Don't say that's a heart. Anyway, I consider him to be the grandfather. Uh, he's my hero, my longtime hero. I also have his, I have my middle name is his first name, John. His first and last. This is Howard Zahneiser, who might consider the father of the wilderness act. He, more than anybody else, worked his rear end off to get uh, to get the wilderness act passed through Congress, both houses of Congress. He uh, he participated in um, in all 60 written drafts of the act, 16 hearings in Congress. Um, he uh, he had a special coat, in fact, an overcoat. Um, made so that he could have four huge pockets going on the inside to carry all his lobbying. <laughs> <laughs> Plus the suitcase. He, um, he was a dedicated man and um, he was, on, he was um, in the halls there, walking the halls almost every day for, for years. He visited every single member of Congress more, you know, more than once. And uh, ultimately died. He uh, died of overwork. He uh, just wore himself out. Um, in any case, um, I really regard him very highly as the as the father of the Lord's Act. There are other people, such as Aldo Leopold. A lot of you, probably all of you, have read the Sand County Almanac. It talks about his land ethic. Um, he was a friend of. Uh, Friend of Don Eisner's and a lot of others, I'll, I'll mention in just a minute. Uh, they were all part of the Wilderness Society, set up by Robert Marshall in, in the 30s. Um, another man, Sigurd Olson, also a good friend and fellow activist. Rachel Carson, a person who brought science, probably more than any of the other actors, brought science to, um, to the Wilderness Act. Consulted uh, with Howard Zahneiser and many others. And of course, Marty and Olaf Murray. Um, Olaf at this time worked very hard as part of the Wilderness Society with all the other actors that you saw beforehand, um, except for John New York. He was already dead. And uh, getting this, uh, this very important act passed. And finally, after all their work, in 1964, September 3rd, coming up very shortly, um, it was signed into law. I'll have to back up just a little ways. As a result of the efforts of, of these people, it passed both houses of Congress almost unanimously. It's a, it's a very unique um, law in that uh, almost everyone Almost everyone voted for it. And then it was signed, as they say, on September 3rd by Lyndon Johnson. And when he signed it, he, um, let's see if I can get this right. He said, if future generations are remembered with gratitude rather than contempt, we have to, let's see, we must leave them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning and not after we got through it. Remember, true words were said. All right, but you can see in the background here, Marty Neri. By then, um, her husband Olaf was dead. He died the previous year in October, 1963. And Alice Zahneiser, um, Howard died just five months before. Didn't see the signing of the act, which is a shame. So here, um, Marty and Alice are honored. Receiving the plans that the signing of the Act has been adjusted. Okay, let's um, go on. Uh, I'll have to, first of all, back up just a bit. When Lyndon Johnson signed the Act, uh, he signed the law only nine, about 9.1 9 million acres of wilderness. Not very much you know, compared to what we have today. Um, when President Carter signed the Anoka in 1980, there were 106 million acres. And uh, most of that, of course, was in Alaska. Today, we have more than 110 million acres as a result of the efforts of, of um, 
all these people and more. People who regarded um, wilderness as something that was valuable for future generations. Jonathan said in the state. All right, with that, um, we'll go on to the images. All right. Everybody recognizes Denali. <laughs> that Denali has many, many faces. This is one of its prettiest in fall. And, uh, it's, this is going to happen in about two more weeks. <laughs> some of its denizens, of course, uh, some of its, uh, its big ones, its charismatic one, as people refer to them. Some of it's small, less charismatic or poor. Mm -hmm. That's a little water press, water press. I'm going to go back and forth with great and small, and, uh, and it'll be mostly images of, of, um, of these favorite wildernesses of mine and during my adventure, various adventures that I've had. Probably most of you are familiar with how you how you actually age sheep, but I threw this in um, because I want I wanted to show those who may not be as familiar um, with these little lines here. See, you, you just count them one, maybe one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, maybe seven, eight. Maybe an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, perhaps. But for those who are not familiar with that. Uh, some of the lesser, um, but this little guy here, rock jasmine, is one of the most fragrant of flowers there. I just scoop down and you can see it. It's like a little pretty knot, it's white, with a yellow eye. And just scoop down and I think you know so. It really truly will be nose. You recognize that from the people in the Denali National Park, and the reflection pond. One of the most beautiful locations for taking a picture of Denali. Okay. Narcissus uh, flowering anem anem anemones. Over to another um, wilderness park. This is Gates Fiore. And this is the Gates right here. You can see. Royal Mountain, Pretty Crags, it's taken just down below Ernie Pass, and this is right next to Ernie Crick here, North Fork of Quetico. And um, if anybody ever tries this, um, I advise not going across this section. <laughs> <laughs> really highly advise not. Go over here into Ernie Crick. This is a terrible, terrible um, area of tussocks. Really, like two and three feet high sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, this is the guy here, Robert Marshall, who brought it to the attention of the world, this whole area. Uh, he spent two years to one full year up there in um, Wiseman and wrote a book about it called Arctic Village. And the um, young man, when he came up, um, and uh, the man actually who was responsible for founding, founding the Wilderness Society, and came up to Alaska and um, back in World War 48 again, he died of heart failure at 38 years of age. Mm -hmm. young. <coughs> this is one of the areas that's been set aside, the Arctic Edge Peaks. I took my first son up there in the early 80s. And um, just the world, uh, it's a world heritage area. Incredible. The name Aragetch means fingers uh, outstretched, fingers outstretched in uh, Yupiat, but I think it's, it, these peaks look more like um, air fangs. Fingers of the hand outstretched, that's what it means. Uh, by something a lesser flower, but uh, out of you know, its glory. But uh, there's a good reason for it, because they're out of water. They're underwater. This is my son, my older son. When he was just a teenager, I brought him into the Maw of the Glacier, as I call it. 
who is a cousin of my nephew. My son now is uh, 45. Long time ago. <laughs> Evidence of some of the uh, animals uh, right next to our camp, actually. And for those who have been up there, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. Um, sow and a cub, and uh, a wolf right next to it. Very, very fresh. Something uh, that a lot of you may not know, this is a special moss for me, my favorite moss, very parasol. And it's, it's unique in, a, in another way in that uh, it only grows on animal top. Bear dung, uh, wolf dung, above wolf dung, and uh, moose dung. And it, that's its favorite host. Right, this is um, right from the from up top, you might say, in the uh, peaks, the very peaks, the um, camping area is right down here. It's a nice walk up the edge here, and across, and on up into the glaciers, the Alpine glaciers in the 80s. Uh, they were quite large. That's when I was there with my second son in the uh, late nineties. They had receded quite a bit, quite a bit. We all know why. This is a Perry's wallflower down in the, uh, in the valley, above the valley, above that uh, well-drained soil. A lot of cobbles, a little mustard, must, mustard family, the brassicacea. Of the flower and very fragrant. As some may uh, recognize the statue of Little Lake. The Helmer cabin is right there. We had a lease to that cabin at the time, so we were hiking across. This is my older son and myself and my nephew. We were hiking across country um, to Bud's cabin. We were going to stay for another week or so. You see the uh, river out there. Lady Slipper, one of the um, orchids that you find in that area. Interesting that um, there are seven orchids that are found north of the Arctic Circle. Um, the thir we have 13 orchids that I know of in Alaska, and uh, seven of them are found north of the Arctic Circle. This is one of them. Uh, Walker Lake, a trip that I took in 2006. Um, but Helmer, Helmer's family still has a cabin out here somewhere. Swan Island, but it's a beautiful lake. And this is where we started in October, the second time. If you have my book, you'll see this, this lake is featured at the end of the book. And um, I also recapitulate some of my first survival adventure um, back in 1971, I think it was, down the Cobalt River. In Wooden raft, Tom Sawyer raft, not the thing. So. <laughs> I'm over to uh, the Arctic Refuge, my wife and I, on uh, Marsh Fork, the uh, Canning River, and Upper Marsh Fork. Um, actually, this is one of the tributaries, and I uh, show this uh, not only show my wife, but also show the off-ice and all of the different laminations of off-ice that there are, seasonal ice um, during the wintertime, the result of runoff from this. It's kind of very interesting, of course, the, the dirt, the wind blown uh, calcium or slate, shale slate. Most of these mountains, I'll mention again, are made of calcium or calcite. Trigger, one of my favorite uh, songbirds because he is the world champion songbird migrant. He migrates 18,600 miles back and forth from sub-Saharan uh, Africa every single year. Spends the winter there, comes up to Alaska for only three months, and then leaves again. In fact, he's already left by now. Northern media. In fact, I, I usually take a bunch of folks out to um, Workersham Dome in about another week. To, uh, in fact, uh, well, we remember that trip. I took you out there that time. We saw weirs. 
One of the mountains out there, a uh, um, beautiful mountain, calcite, slate. Um, different moods, the same mountain. It's um, right at the Marsh Fork airstrip there, the main airstrip. First picture was taken about a little early evening, just a little later in the evening, and at midnight. And then early in the morning, same amount. Yeah. So it's amazing the moods of, of, um, of all these wild, these wilderness areas, they're just stunning sometimes. You know, they're beyond it. Some of the adaptations up there, um, flowers. This is uh, the woolly louse work, and uh, when it's young, it has a lot of walls. And then it becomes this beautiful flower. <clears throat> Parsi squirrel, curious. This is um, a picture I took with Susan and Keith uh, a few years ago. And it didn't make those tracks. <laughs> <laughs> those tracks are made by a critter that likes to meet practice squirrels. <coughs> Up close and personal. And likes to eat caribou. This is a trip that uh, a guy by the name of Don Ross and I took um, well, a few years ago, back in 2001 or two, and we walked right through the middle of the porcupine herd. 40,000 animals, it's incredible. They walked through the middle of our tent almost, and there were so many of them. Just traveling by one group, another one, and bulls. And I include this because this is um, their favorite food, especially the out in the coastal plain. Favorite food of the, uh, especially the cows who have to, to um, eat this stuff. That, uh, Cotton grass, by the way, very often vegetarian, and it uh, it gives them some of the most nourishing milk of any, of any animal. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the caribou out there in that very harsh environment have to be tough because they become tough to this stuff. And it's one of the reasons why we don't want the oil company out on the coastal plain right? because there's a lot of this out there and it will interfere with um, with the feeding. Feeding of the caribou. And there are a lot of caribou that get out there you know, about every other year. And just that. Another trip uh, up the Manitoubi Pass, up the uh, Manitoubi River. This is in July. You can see the outside is melting uh, quite rapidly there. It's amazing how rapidly the outside does melt when it decides to. Hot days, a lot of water, running, running water. Looks here right away. This is some of the country up in there. Again, you see the same or similar formations. Uh, the ones over there, much further over in, in the Arctic National Wildlife Park. This is in Gates the Arctic Park. I throw this in because you know you wouldn't expect a robin up there, would you? But there it was. We had to um, we were on a trip just a couple of years ago, actually a couple of summers ago, and um, we had to do act because a big storm came in from Siberia, and uh, right away we put up our tents in the willows, more than alders, and uh, we had no choice but to be this Robin's neighbor for the night. She came in, the day split, so after we put up our tent, and she was there for the rest of the night. She didn't mind us at all. And this is what um, issues from those eggs. A little bit later, in another area, the Robin. Well, they're tough robins. They're still used to people, though. You know, they must be, they must become familiar with people during the winter, you know, the south. Not afraid of at all. This is a, uh, talk about an adaptation. So, this is a Crixus Arctic butterfly, and they're made. But you know, it takes two years for metamorphosis to take place. Uh, pupa, uh, pupa takes two years for it to hatch into the adult. Of course, you can see the dark color. Um, a lot of um, critters up there, and a 
but uh, flowers are dark. Because the closer darker you are, the more you absorb the heat from the sun. The more you are. <laughs> this little guy, however, these guys, little guys, are actually females. Uh, don't take all that time to, all that much time to do metamorphosis. It's very quick to come back. And they're all awesome. close and personal. <laughs> however, I'm a bird. So I kind of like to speak. <laughs> they really serve a purpose. They feed birds. They feed so many birds, and they feed them well. All right. I don't care a few bites here and there. Yeah. As much as I lose, oh my. You know, we have an ally. Uh, I don't know if any of you have experienced this bee fly up there. It's a large bee fly, almost the size of a horse fly. It's not a horse fly, but it eats mosquitoes. We found them every morning on our fly, eating mosquitoes. They crunch them. I can catch them and crunch them even. So, and at night as well. And this is perched on Jennifer's hat. And it was waiting, just waiting for the mozzies that came around our faces. Another insect, kind of interesting. Normally, I was talking about dark color. They're normally, these four spots are, are dark. Usually, but I found some that uh, are red. Why I don't know, but uh, maybe I, I don't know exactly. But I uh, threw this in just to uh, kind of query anybody who might be interested in four spotted lady beetles that are now red rather than dark, maybe some brown. Um, a discovery I made um, a couple of summers ago. I never knew that um, hardy warblers were in the Anacluic River Valley. Uh, they're not on any range map in the valley, but we saw probably well, 25 to 30 singing males like this. And uh, I was able to get one good picture. It's uh, an hardy warbler. And um, something I discovered not very long ago is that um, hardy warblers are not warblers. They are not warblers. They're called old world, old world warblers, and so they can think that they're close, more closely related to catches and kinglets. They're not related to all warblers. But they're here. They're, uh, they're very, um, they're all over Siberia. And they've only come into Alaska, I don't know exactly you know, since when, but probably over the last 200 years, because there's a lot of food out. Oh, by the way, just uh, for those who might be interested to go back to this guy, my grandson and I were out on the Denali Highway just last week, and we found all kinds of stuff. They're on the map. They're on the range map. Um, if you ever want to see party forwarders close by, they're a fascinating person. Because they like the northern weeder and the yellow tail, the yellow white tail, I mean, the yellow white tail, the blue throat. And this little guy right here, they all cross the Bering Street every, straight every every fall, and they go to Southeast Asia, this the weir, all the way to Africa, and then they come back up again in the spring. And they spend three months here. So they're one of the four, this is one of the four songbirds that did that. Um, Moss Canton, another adaptation. A lot of flowers up there. The, um, <coughs> They uh, grow in colonies. And that keeps them warm in the early part of their growth. Now, this is a hitchhiker. These are hitchhikers. These guys, these are avens, not avens, and they live apart. You know. However, these guys seem to be, this might be some sort of symbiosis or, or something akin to symbiosis, living with uh, moth cancer. One of the favorite, uh, this is um, part of the wild scenic river system. Around Tango Lake. I throw that in because of, because of the picture. It was early morning. I just love this picture. And it really gives you a feel for the lake. Um, <coughs> and after being in that area once again with my grandson last week, that whole area around the Esker, you know what I'm talking about. You know, like the road on top of the Esker and uh, all the pothole lakes, the turns in that area. I'm so convinced that this area needs to be made into a refuge. Take time. We saw a couple of these out there. 
This is not a drum tango lick. That's at the end of the tango lick section. Um, Wild and Scenic River, I include some of these scenic rivers. This is very important too, as, as uh, wild country. Not wilderness, not designated wilderness, but uh, certainly wild. This is uh, Birch Creek. Again, Birch Creek. You know, the rapid you can down there, Canyon Rapid. Getting me out of <coughs> once. Again, down at the very bottom. Moves to the river. It moves of wild country. Um, early in the morning. This is almost a landmark uh, many years ago. Maybe not so many years ago now, but not down at the bottom of Birch Creek, just uh, getting out of the hills with a big ice bridge. And um, I haven't been down here for about three years, maybe three or four years. But uh, for the last maybe 10 years, I haven't seen it. It's completely melted and um, everything subsided. Another sign of, of climate change. Something on the on, on rivers that you'll find, if you look carefully, I did this, uh, this spring uh, on the Chino River. Even. This was uh, actually on um, Birch. Northern swallowtails having a um, having a good time with merganser guano. Merganser guano there, and they love merganser guano. Merganser guano because mergansers eat fish, and it's very rich in nutrients. So you'll see these feeding frenzies, um, especially down in the areas where mergansers feed. A good friend of mine, Don Ross. And he was my pilot for many years. He started with uh, Roger Dowding. I went to the army with Don, and he retired to Kurt Sweetser and Kurt Pekish. And uh, Don and I did a trip from the Beaufort Sea once um, all the way over to um, Chinjik River, and then down Chinjik to Fort Yukon. It took us more than a month. These are some of the critters that we saw, some of the muskox. A big old male with a harem, I think there are eight or nine females. Some big, big bull. They came right to our tent. I think they mistook our tent for another muskox. <laughs> and uh, during that same trip, we, uh, we were caught by a huge snowstorm. We had a bivouac um, for about maybe 18 hours. We finally were able to go mountain for about 2,000 feet, which is very, very narrow draw to the top, and uh, across pass after pass after pass, um, so finally we got to the other side, things started to melt, and went down to the Achillic. This is on the Leffing Well. Started on the Leffing Well, and went down to the Achillic. All part of that trip from Beaufort over to Shimon. Pretty country, you can see it, I'll show it. And uh, things, when things start to melt, you have the glacier ravens. You see the adaptation also uh, for this little flower with uh, the bald wool, especially when they're younger. They have a lot of wool, they call it pubescence. Picture I threw in, because I thought it was kind of pretty, the clouds in particular. This is on the Marsh Fork of Canning. This ain't pretending to be a character. Remember that, Susan? Mm -hmm. Susan Campbell up here, Pete, and a couple friends, and my wife, Ken. We walked from the other shack over to Marsh Park. Every now and again, um, we might have a problem with blisters. That always happens, and uh, most of the time we fix them with duct tape. <laughs> so moleskin and duct tape works quite well. I won't tell you this. Not much. But uh, I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember this, this encounter with the law army? Yeah, this guy thought I was a competitor. It's the male here, of course, is female. And they were courting, you know. So, you know, I just uh, 
interceded there as I was taking the picture. I'm like, and I'll tell you, as soon as I did that, you raced that. You just raced right for it. And I just stopped, walked away, pretending I wasn't there. And I went, I raced that. So just, for sure. By the way, a physicist is what the Yupik people call uh, Willow Charming. And, and I, I learned these names out there in the brief. I was 21 years I taught out there. Another really interesting bird. You know, this is a pivot nest. An American pivot nest. We used to call them water pivots. But about 80% of the nests I found up there, they have six eggs. There's another one under there. And they have this sixth egg on top. And I think it's there because it's easier for the female to root. That's what I think. She just sits on top of them and it's easier to <coughs> keep them warm. All right. Anyway, um, I had I did I never had a good picture of, of her until this year. And um, I was up in the Gilbert Lake area and finally got a picture of a female pit next to her. And she had the same Configuration of eggs on her nest. Exactly the same. There she is. Pretty little bird. Now, I throw this in here because I don't know if these are. All right? This is an amendment. Keith and I, we looked at this, we looked at and, and Dennis, we looked at it and we looked at it and we, we had all these theories, you know, what it might be. And I've gone online and checked with geologists after geologists. Nobody can really identify. All I know is that it's very hard, it's probably metamorphic. It's got this little egg yolk inside, you know, you know what it's made of. Of course, we have iron in there, probably manganese, but anybody has an idea of it, okay? If you know anything about this kind of thing. They were nodules, um, they were in a very soft matrix. We found them in this little trick that they're halfway between the Ibishak and uh, Marsh Fork. Another rock, I thought it was kind of free rock up there at the top of uh, the pass in a tubic area with some very pretty people like lichen, which I do, up close and personal, Xantharia lichen, they're beautiful orange lichens at that time of the year, it's in June, June, July. Just cover the cover up. Okay, back to uh, a little more. A little more of a close-up um, of the mountains. You can see how these things have been twisted and turned and distorted and converted, you know, by time and tectonic movement. But um, these are. This is all. Um, they're all calcium creatures that are made of calcium, such as this. All right. Mm -hmm. 250 to 350 million years ago, and I learned not too long ago that there's a spot up in the, uh, of the Sunset Pass. Uh, actually, the Sabarotich in general, they're 800 million years old up there, uh, composed of dolomite and uh, calcium from critters just like this, all right, and others. So this is what they look like very close. Um, you can see the polyps, the 250, 300 million years ago. Ammonite, a little cephalopod, about 200 million, maybe not quite 200 million years old, up there. Find a lot of those. Back to the present. Great brown rosy fish, eating um, uh, extremely hungry, and I walked right up to it. Sometimes when they're in bloom, you'll find them all over the place, and you can smell them for a half a mile, half a mile away. They are just, uh, you know, uh, in the heaven, I guess, uh, that's the one I want. They're filled with rhododendrons, mm -hmm. Kamchatka rhododendrons, left line rhododendrons, they <coughs> don't have a name for it. More off ice, that's the upper marsh fork, tributary of the marsh fork. Sometimes the off ice gets 12 feet high. On the Concord, during a, a walk down the Concord, the machine chip once, 
Something that's kind of interesting at the end of, uh, usually found at the end of off ice formations, uh, I call it a, an icy loop uh, or an ice pingo. But uh, I don't know, you know, again, I've theorized over and over again about what it is, you know, but it's only in the, in the domain of a kind theory. But I think it's probably the result of um, pressure exerted by uh, a lot of water coming down under, underneath the uh, off ice, and right towards the end it gets jammed up, and then it pushes that ice up. Right? Because at this time it's quite soft, it's a lot of candle ice, and, um, and it pushes it up, to form the ice. Quite strong, as you can see. It's just a little one. Oh, no, they're huge. Um, little, um, section of off ice on Marsh Fork, a little further down. Uh, the canning, the canning is right down here. Another flower that, uh, that has the same adapta adaptation of um, wool, woolly, uh, especially when it's young, heat form, in its younger stages, that's the arnica, the, I call it a woolly arnica, the arnica arnica. You can see some wool here. When it's very young, it's just covered with wool. Another uh, little flower, same family, master family, was the hot beard, the dwarf hot beard. It's probably the most in gravel. On the other hand, this guy is way up hot. Long tail digger, and you can see this is his perch. It is male. Standing guard. And uh, female was here just a few seconds ago. Guarding the nest, but I spooked it just for a second. I went in to take a picture and just to give you an idea of how large those eggs are. And sometimes multicolored. At least uh, one may be brown and one may be blue. I found it almost a completely blue brown splotch. Blue egg with the brown egg. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. However, uh, uh, just a few seconds later, that's the female right there. She's a natural. And you will take your hat off. What about it? Um, you know, these are young shrikes. Are they shrikes? I've never seen northern shrikes before. And I saw these at the, uh, in the Marsh Fork area. There were about four of them, and two of them were, uh, I was able to get right underneath and take a picture of them. Jacob's ladder, this is the tall Jacob's ladder. There's also the memorial there, which is much smaller. Um, Arctic poppy, and one of the reasons I show this, not only because it's, it's a pretty flower, but because uh, it. Uh, it has a, an interesting adaptation. It's a corolla, it's in the form of a parabola. And inside that parabola, it's 15 degrees warmer than it is outside. Usually. Yeah, so it, uh, it's important to keep this part of the plant right, not warmer. So uh, this is one of the reasons for that. And I'm sure that uh, you know, some of these others, they have the same adaptation. Um, the parabolic effect, let's call it. And Rich knows a lot about that. It's really important up there in the Arctic. A couple of flowers in the tundra, my wife and Cindy. See, just a, you know, at this time of the year, it's just incredible. Flowers out there, these are like lupins and avens and rhododendron and on and on. These are less garnicas, so they're nodding, they have these nodding heads, like that. I'll show you a picture of one of those, and of course the sweet pea, which is another fragrant flower up there. A little critter, you probably recognize that. Honey, 
this one was special. I mean, it was great. Um, great. And uh, Alex Bureau and I were on our way up a mountain in the Antutic area. And uh, we looked back. I couldn't believe it. There was a grizzly bear right behind it. And it, it focused on us over there right here and pounced on it. And that was the end of it. That was it. Next generation. But that's the way it is out there. Nature raw and tooth and claw. Except that. The horn bark. See the horn up here? Yeah, there. And uh, I, I show you this because this is the earliest nesting of all the songbirds up there on the right. But also the earliest um, migrant. He's the migrant out, right? He's um, by mid July they're gone. Right? Heading for Arizona, New Mexico. Interesting little bird. Pretty flower, um, pixie eye, pixie eye primrose, and the lacy thing. You know, it's interesting because the flowers, uh, they're really pretty like that. They don't have so many, so much uh, fragrance. Uh, it gives a lot of uh, I recognize that as an American golden flower, and then a broken wing ant. A nest nearby. Surprise there. Um, Sunset Pass area, and you can see out uh, way out into the uh, Arctic, the Beaufort Sea. See the this was a number of years ago. It's the trip we were on, Cindy and Jen, and um, that's the Arctic ice pack out there. In those days, um, it was much more evident than it is now. Sometimes it's just not there at that time. This was uh, mid June. Oh, sorry. Why did I show the picture? Um, yeah, uh, ancient uh, Nupiat, uh, probably Nunamut uh, hunting site, a camping area, camping site. Here and you can see the outline of a caribou skin tent that they used. There was also a food cache over here. Um, you might remember the plant here. And then the other thing. We found there was this oil lamp because they don't carry them. They didn't carry them when they when they traveled. Um, they usually stayed in an area just uh, for a little while, and then they moved on. And they left this to use the next time. Right. They also left their food cache for out. They buried it with rocks so the bears wouldn't get it. For the wolves. But when they came, when they needed it, it would be there. Um, you might wonder. Some people might wonder uh, why do they call or what is uh, the Ocracovic really mean? Or the Ocracovic River. It's, um, and it, in Yupiat, it's really pronounced Ocobovic. Ocobovic. It means the place uh, where blubber is buried, or where you find blubber, <laughs> seal blubber. So um, they bury these, they have these blubber piles and certain strategic places so that we could access them when they needed them. It's the same with caribou, caribou meat. Right? They always line their pits before they put meat in with grass, of course. Um, and then they cover them with rocks. We're getting there. I don't have to tell you what that is. But the reason I put it in there, besides that they're pretty and that they flower, is because of the areas. Um, the Arctic Refuge, where a lot of this, a lot of these pictures were taken, um, it happened really because of Olaf and Marty. Back in the 50s, of course, Olaf and Marty came up to uh, the Shinjik. Uh, yeah, it was the Shinjik in 1956 through the science. It ultimately led to the, to the, um, not the passage of an act, but rather to the declaration of, of the. Arctic National Wildlife Range, which in the Canadian became the refuge. So it was due to the efforts of the Murrays and of course a few other people that it happened. And this is kind of, I think the last, last version of the last slide. Speaking of which, this double mountain, I, I usually went in there or ended up there a number of times. 
just drip down here. Machine your quiver, and uh, not very far away, uh, somewhere down in here is uh, Last Lake. And a friend of mine, Andrew, a young friend, <coughs> and we uh, we were floating, floating in the machine at the time, and doing some mountain climbing along the way. And this, by the way, if you ever do this river, this is um this is the best place to really enjoy yourself for about five or six days or more um, up in the mountains because very soon you get out of the flat country. It's not as much fun anymore if you like, if you like to climb. Right. There's a lot of opportunities close to the river to climb. Um, on this river, you'll find a little bit further down, you'll find this, this guy right here. An already turned. And I show you this bird because this bird is very special in that if you disturb its nest or its young, it's going to poop on you. It's going to fly right over here like the jay is doing. It's going to poop on you. It won't grab your hat. <laughs> Because this one did. <laughs> right on my jacket. Copious. <laughs> this was down the, uh, on the Shinjik, very close to Port Klein. And speaking of Port Klein, there are Olaf's and Marty again. Another favorite river of theirs. They were there in. When was it, Roger? 1926? They came up with their baby, yeah, one-year-old baby, and they named John and uh, Martin, 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 and they went all the way up to Fort Pine and to the, uh, the Old Crow, not the Old Crow River, and of course, uh, not about a month, mosquitoes. Um, but I uh, did some work up there, a lot of biology. And Marty, I don't know how much she enjoyed it, a little baby like that, but uh, she certainly remembers it, doesn't she? Book. Far North, which I recommend to anybody who hasn't read it. Read it. It's a good book. This is the porcupine <coughs> and the ramparts. I was doing a helping friend an hour do a survey, a urban conference survey at the time, and uh, climbed a lot of these guys. One friend, this friend there, and uh, some of our friends. It can be a little dangerous sometimes, but this is what we have to do. We don't do that. It's not done anymore. These um, surveys don't include bending, so um, you don't have to bend. These, the certain population is redundant, and so um, you don't really have to keep track of it as much. The survey is done every two or three years. Another picture of Deacon Point on the Porcupine River there. Uh, um, a river as every, with every wild river, every wilderness, with different moods. Down in the lower part of the porcupine, a uh, storm cell coming across the porcupine, or the Yukon Flats, actually, is what these are called. Um, just one after the other sometimes. It's just pretty impressive uh, to see these storm cells move across, sometimes quite rapidly. Uh, speaking of storm cells, uh, flowers have their own little storm cell configuration too. Zeal dryas, you find those on the river, right on the river bank. And, uh, you can see their little whorls, like right? these whorls. Right? Look like little galaxies. Mm -hmm. This is the lower porcupine, a very heavily braided area. Uh, it takes you a long time to get down to <laughs> Fort Yukon. Yeah. Um, the back porcupine leads into the Yukon. That leads eventually down to the lower Yukon. And this is where my wife and I taught for 21 years. And uh, one of my favorite places. Absolutely not. One of my favorite places on Earth. Um, I know there are a lot of mosquitoes during the summertime, but there are a lot of birds. Maybe. Um, there are millions of birds that live out there, that nest out there, and that um, stage out there. And um, they stage in the fall, and you can see the colors. The fall is just a beautiful orange, almost yellow orange, rusty color. These are swans, these are tons of swans staging, and they stage by hundreds, 
and sometimes even more than that. And so the Dunlins and the Western Sandpipers and probably five or six other species by, by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands sometimes to see that, just something out of this world. Right? Um, if you ever get the opportunity to go down there. This was right at the, uh, the very mouth of the Yukon River, uh, below, um, it was below Alakanar, up towards um, Sheldon Point, it used to be called Sheldon Point. And I had to throw this in because again, Marty, she's one of my cultural heroes, always will be. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I didn't know how important a man the Polas was, but uh, I did meet him, my uncle, who some of you knew, um, knew Olas, and uh, I was working on campus in 1963. This was a uh, probably June, I met early June, he came up to Marty. I didn't see Marty, but he was talking with um, Iris Garland and, and uh, Geist, Otto Geist, and Chuck. And they were all talking there, all four of them. And I was just passing from one place to another outside the, uh, the old gym, they called it. Um, and uh, Chuck said, come over here. I want you to meet some folks. Here Shrugged it off, you know, old timer, that guy. So, but, you know, I'm really happy I met him. Marty, I didn't meet until 2001. Now, I got to know Marty to correspond because I was doing an article on Olas back in 1981, 81 out in Hooper Bay, because I met his, um, his guides after, Mike Simon and Tom Tomodin. So I wanted to do an article on him, and I started writing Marty asking her whether or not um, Olas mentioned mentioned uh, these guys, these guys like Simon and, uh, and Tom Tomato. And she looked and looked and looked through his journals. She wrote me back a couple of times and uh, said, you know, she found her first name, but not her last name. And so I felt, um, I felt even more justified in writing that article. Mike Simon and Tom Tomato, because they were the guys that really made the, the first biological survey out there in 1924. They made it successful. And so I was really, I came to know Mike Simon in particular fairly well for the next 15 years until he died. Tom Tomato died while I was in Hooper Bay. But uh, so Marty Murray, I finally got a chance to meet the fair and stay at their ranch for three nights, actually two nights, three days, and to talk with her. See, she had. Um, she was quite lucid, even though she was 99. She was quite lucid. I showed her slides and I showed her video and chatted with her. And just to see her eyes it was quite a lot of spark. They really were. Right. I'm her too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this is the end. Uh, pretty much the end. I just wanted to, read, to show you again that some of these favorite wild areas. Andriaski, by the way, is the one in the lower Yukon that uh, I'm familiar with down there. Um, Wrangell St. Elias, everybody knows. And um, I'll go to this. And this is a statement by Wallace Stegner, something which pretty much sums up the importance of wilderness and why we should keep it. Something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed. We need wilderness preserved as much of it as is still left. Reminder and reassurance that it is still there is good for our spiritual health, even if we never want to set foot in it. This is paraphrased, but it gives you the essential idea. And um, never a truer statement for our life essentials. And that does it. Well, I promised an hour, and my God, it took you nine minutes. And that's <laughs>
It's so different. It's so varied. And that way, I have someone watching your books because I've been clean up in here. Here is uh, your money so far. Sorry. <laughs> like a drug deal. Mm. Like a drug deal. <laughs> Since you were saying this to me, I was forced, but I learned more this time. I mean, because he, I never else, I wasn't it. looking at the forest anymore, and I'm looking at the trees and listening to him. That's true. You know, it's, that can happen. You move into that. Yeah. It's kind of a question for you. Yeah? Um, on the porcupine, when I was down, I'm going to mention this for you. We learned this. Watch out! It would go down the river and be an eagle's territory. And they were. Well, yeah, that's right. You were, you were on the porcupine just last year. Two years ago. Two years ago. Counting this one. And we would look and keep an eye out above the eagle. You'd see a peregrine come out and nail it. And this would happen to maybe a dozen times. You know, we moved from from eagles' territory. <laughs> the question is, do they normally or just something like black bears and grizzlies, or I mean, um, yeah, black bears and grizzlies, or they should not overlap. They they seem very yeah. No, the bald eagles are very Oh, well, I'll tell you what. They, they seem that they couldn't go have it. I mean, they didn't get along with us. Golden eagles and peregrines get along. Small in one direction. Now, bald eagles and peregrines get along like this. It is a lot like But then the bald eagles are quite a bald too. Every time they pass through the space, it okay. seems a, a peregrines are jeers. Yeah, well, what would happen is we would drift down and the eagle would start paying attention to us. And he'd be circling over there. And, and the eagle would drift out of his territory and into the peregrine's territory. And then we would look up and we'd start looking for the peregrine after a while. You know, it'd only be about a mile or so, or two in the river, it seemed like. Uh, it wasn't very far. And then this, then this uh, peregrine would come out of the sky. You'd see this little dot grow and grow and grow. Sometimes he, there'd be feathers flying, and then sometimes the eagle would wise up at the last second and take a dive. And he'd run down to a cut bank on the river and hide under it or in the trees or something while the peregrine circled. Sorry, really? there's no formal question to answer. If you'd like, you know, he was he was uh, rushed. <laughs> But you know something? They're nothing compared to Arctic Terns. <laughs> Arctic Terns will be after those paradigms and jeers and and uh, other raptors like you would not see. You know what? Virtually, it's in the valley. Totally different. You go out the valley and there was a rock with a little lighthouse right in the middle of the narrow arc. Well, I kayaked out there and the I got started really late from the valley when I got out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had that little spin. I was and this was quite before I found the valley. I was walking out here today. I know she wants to have it. But she told me. It's funny. You gotta get out of here. You gotta spend more time. Anyway, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all going to the same place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all going to the same place. I heard that it was a And that's what you're talking about.